Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We are pleased to have Dr. Russell Barkley here to talk about deficient emotional self-regulation, the overlooked ADHD symptom that affects everything. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 369 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. And today's sponsor of the webinar is the OHSU Center for ADHD Research, which conducts cutting edge research into the causes and genetics of ADHD and develops breakthrough treatments. Give hope and help change lives with impactful science. Support the center's research by clicking on the hyperlink on your screen. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting the webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for today's topic. Deficient emotional self-regulation is the inability to regulate responses to certain emotions and to avoid overreacting to life situations. But it is excluded from the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for ADHD, even though it has serious negative effects on a person's daily functioning. Everything from a greater risk of having a car accident, to never being married, to having a lower quality of life. In addition, DESR, as it's called, may worsen other ADHD symptoms and plays a part in several comorbid disorders, especially oppositional defiant disorder. Dr. Barkley will discuss how to determine which aspects of emotional dysregulation stem from ADHD or a comorbid condition. He will also outline the best approach to diagnosing and treating DESR. Dr. Barkley is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children and Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia. He is a clinical scientist, educator, and practitioner who has published 23 books, rating scales, and clinical manuals numbering 41 editions. He is the founder and editor of the bi-monthly clinical newsletter, The ADHD Report. His websites are www.russellbarkley.org and adhdlectures.com. You can ask questions of Dr. Barkley during his presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after he is done. So with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barkley. Thanks so much for being here today. Yes, thank you so much, Wayne, and you too, Lily, for helping me out today. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, an apology, very unusual for me. Um, I um, am recovering from uh, nine rib fractures. Uh, that I had in a car accident about two weeks ago. So I'm going to have to stop more often than I normally do to catch my breath a bit. And that's also why you see me a little bit facially disfigured with some pock marks up here on, on my forehead. But I didn't want to cancel this program because I thought it was important and also because of the large number of pre-registrants that we had. So uh, bear with me and uh, try to teach you something about what I believe is an extraordinarily important but overlooked component of ADHD, and that is the problem with impulsive emotion coupled with difficulties with the self-regulation of strong emotions once they are provoked. Uh, I'm not going to have time to cover everything on every slide, but I wanted you to be able to take these away when you download the slide so that you have more detailed information. Very quickly, in case you don't remember Psychology 101, uh, an emotion is a change in our intentional and motivational stance toward the world. 
usually involves also a change in our subjective experience. It has three components, essentially. There's a behavioral component, whether we're going to approach something or withdraw from something. Is it a threat or is it desirable? That leads to the second. There's a motivational aspect to emotion, a reinforcement punishment aspect. Do we feel pleasure or pain from the uh, event that provoked the emotion? And then, of course, there's a physiological component, which is the degree of intensity uh, of the emotion that we experience internally. So emotions involve all three of those things. But the most important point to make here is that emotions in all other species are provoked by environmental events around them. And in that sense, emotions are sort of a very primitive form of communication of that organism to other organisms about a change in its state at that time. Uh, humans, on the other hand, as we will see, have a second part to their emotions, which is the ability to self-manage them and even provoke their own emotions. But keep in mind, most of the time, our emotions are being elicited or provoked by events around us. Now, when we think about emotional self-regulation, uh, and Lily, I find that the slides are not advancing here for some reason. There we go. Thank you. Uh, we think of emotional self-regulation as involving at least four or more steps or components in the process. Uh, the first is the capacity to inhibit the strong emotion that's been provoked by something around us. Uh, the second is that we then try to calm ourselves down, to self-soothe and downregulate the emotion if it turns out to be something that's very upsetting to us, a sort of one of the negative uh, emotions. Uh, and then what we try to do as well, often simultaneously, is to refocus our attention away from the provocation by interrupting our attention to the event, we can often downregulate the emotion much faster than if we keep paying attention to whatever it is that's bothering us, uh, that is provoking this emotion. So, and, and usually refocusing involves not just distracting yourself or looking away, uh, but may also involve a cognitive type of refocusing where we reappraise and reevaluate the event in our mind as to its real importance versus what has been provoked in us. And then finally, humans organize new emotions. They modify the emotion they're experiencing, and they may even be able to substitute a different emotion, a healthier emotion, one that's more consistent with their goal in that situation and more consistent with their longer-term welfare. So it, it's quite a complex phenomenon, this inhibition of emotion coupled with the self-regulation of emotion. And beginning about 10 years ago, I began to argue that this is precisely uh, what was missing in ADHD and had been for some time. Now, if I was correct, if emotion is central to ADHD, then what would we expect to see? We would see that part of ADHD isn't just hyperactivity or impulsive words or impulsive motor actions and inattention and distraction, there would also be impulsive emotion. The emotion that an individual experience would come up very quickly, much more strongly than in others because they're not suppressing and inhibiting and moderating it. And although this is true of all emotion, levity, humor, affection, and so on, it's especially problematic with the negative emotions of impatience, frustration, hostility, anger, and even the propensity for reactive aggression when we get upset. Uh, all of these would be expected to be more common in people with ADHD, but what would be especially problematic for them would be control of the negative emotions because they are more socially costly than the positive emotions would be. It's okay to be a class clown. You might even be able to make friends and to be a little more silly and aroused and talkative at a party. But it's not okay to express your frustration and anger 
and hostility so quickly toward other people. Uh, that's inexcusable. So that is why we see uh, that people with ADHD have difficulties in their social, occupational, family lives and elsewhere having to do with the expression of strong negative emotions. But also, we would expect that they would have difficulties with grappling with the emotion. Once it's elicited, can they engage in those top-down executive strategies that we use to try to moderate and quell and make the emotion more acceptable to that context and better off for us in the long run as well? Uh, and people with ADHD find it difficult to do that also. Keep that in mind, by the way, because it tells you that it's going to be difficult to entrain this through a skills training program with someone with ADHD because of this basic executive deficit in emotion regulation. Now, just as an aside, I won't dwell on it. Because emotions are part of our motivation and give us self-motivation, then we should see that there would be problems with motivation in people with ADHD, procrastination, difficulties with starting and finishing work. They can't sustain their activities as long as others in the absence of external consequences that are immediate and motivating to them. Internal motivation, self-motivation is quite weak. So uh, that's what we would speculate should be involved if my point here is true, that ADHD does involve problems with emotional self-regulation as a central feature of the disorder. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to prove to you that it is part of ADHD uh, and show you why it is such an important component in understanding and conceptualizing the disorder and in helping to diagnose and manage it. So very quickly, I'm gonna go through the history of emotion and ADHD, the neuroanatomy, uh, the neuropsychology of the emotional problems in ADHD, evidence from psychology that impulsive emotion is uh, ab absolutely a part of ADHD. Uh, and then of course, I'm going to help you see why putting emotion back in ADHD explains several of the major comorbid disorders that will arise over time as a result of these emotional control difficulties. And one of those, the most common in children anyway, is oppositional defiant disorder. But I also wanna show you that the emotional aspects of ADHD predict a whole slew of impairments that we can't understand from simply the traditional symptoms of ADHD, the attention deficits and the hyperactive impulsive behavior. They can't explain these additional impairments, but the emotional disturbance can. Finally, I'm gonna show you how putting emotion back in ADHD helps us with diagnosis and with management. So buckle up, sit tight. We're gonna take a real quick ride here in the 30 minutes I have remaining to go through all of this. Now, the history of ADHD goes back to the 1700s in Germany in the first medical textbook published, which was by Melchior Adam Weikert, and it contains the first description of people with what today we would call ADHD combined presentation. But even then, uh, now more than 240 to 50 years ago, the first description of this disorder includes descriptions of emotional control problems, and you see them here. And that was followed up by Alexander Crichton's medical textbook, and his chapter on disorders of attention also includes problems with emotion. And then George Still used to be thought to be the founder of ADHD until we discovered Weikert's uh, textbook. George Still, Still thought that emotional problems were the most important component of this disorder, more important than the attentional and the hyperactive components were. Uh, and he referred to this as having the defective moral control over the regulation of behavior and emotion. 
And what he meant by moral control is what today we would refer to as cognitive control or executive functioning. And that is the willful ability to manage ourselves, to govern ourselves. And throughout the 1900s, through the 1960s, the 1970s, 1975, as you see here, all of the major writers at the time had emotion as one core feature of the disorder. Dennis Cantwell, Paul Wender, Mark Stewart, and others. So what happened? Why isn't emotion considered part of the disorder? Because in 1968, when the first DSM manual was published that included childhood disorders, ADHD, which was then called hyperkinetic reaction of childhood, was included, but emotion was removed. And only the hyperactive, inattentive, and impulsive symptoms were mentioned. And that took over all clinical thinking. And from that point on until about a decade ago, people did not realize that emotional dysregulation was in fact a central part of this disorder, even though it had been there for over 170 years. And that was a big mistake, as Wayne mentioned at the beginning. So historically, emotion has always been part of this disorder, even if the DSM didn't acknowledge that. A second line of evidence or reasoning is the neuroanatomy of ADHD. So let's take a look here. This is the neuroanatomy, the neural circuitry of emotion down here, the amygdala and its connections back into our limbic system. This is where emotions are generated. This area here in this sort of orange color is where we attend to these generated emotions, and they may in fact influence what we're thinking about. So how we feel influences what we think, and thinking is going on up here in the general dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and to some extent in the posterior cortex. And this blue area is responsible for the top-down regulation of these provoked emotions. So there's your circuits. Emotions bubble up, get recognized, may influence what we think about, and at the same time, what we're thinking about can be used to suppress, moderate, and alter emotions. It's a bi-directional street between these two. Now, why is that important? Because all of this is implicated in the neuroanatomy of ADHD. The frontal lobe, the uh, anterior cingulate, the um, uh, ventral striatum, as well as the amygdala are all part of the executive circuitry that has been repeatedly shown to be involved in causing ADHD. So there you have it. The neuroanatomy of ADHD includes the neural circuitry of emotion. So problems with emotion regulation logically have to be part of this disorder, even if the DSM doesn't say so. Now, even neuropsychological theories of these brain networks and functions include an emotion regulation circuit. I've already mentioned it to you. Uh, of the three or four major executive circuits, one of which is the working memory or cold cognitive circuit, that's the dorsolateral cortex, going back into the central part of the brain, the striatum. The second is from the dorsolateral cortex through the striatum to the cerebellum, that's the timing circuit, which by the way explains why ADHD is one of the worst disorders you can have when it comes to time management, uh, which is true. Uh, ADHD is devastating with regard to time and time management. Finally, and more to the point of this lecture, one of these four circuits is from the frontal lobe through the midline of the frontal lobe, as I showed you in my past slide, into the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system. This is called the hot circuit. I sometimes call it the Y circuit because it's absolutely crucial for decision-making, as Antonio Damasio argued years ago uh, in his book, Descartes' Error. Uh, so we have in the neuropsychology of ADHD, an emotional regulation circuit that's part of our theories 
of ADHD and its executive function deficits. Again, even though the DSM doesn't include that. And here you can see the four circuits illustrated in a brain diagram. I don't want to spend any more time on that because we've talked about how these are connected with each other already. Uh, but again, to emphasize, one of them is the self-regulation of emotion. And ADHD would be expected to disrupt that substantially. So the next question and line of evidence is, does it? A review of all psychological research on emotion shows that, yes, indeed, it does. For instance, I did a national survey of children and adults from ages 6 through 92 back in around the year 2010. And part of that survey was collecting information on executive functioning, including emotional self-regulation. And of the five dimensions of executive functioning identified in this rating scale, one of the strongest is self-regulation of emotion. And it also proved to be one of the most impaired dimensions in children and adults with ADHD. And there's abundant psychological research besides my own studies. And I'd simply list them here, not for discussion, but other than to say that rating scale studies, direct observation studies, studies of children at the preschool level, all the way up through elementary school into adulthood, studies of the psychophysiology of people with ADHD show problems with emotion regulation in the autonomic nervous system. When we look at family genetics, we can see that the genes responsible for ADHD are also the genes responsible for its emotional problems. So it's not like this is something new that I'm adding into ADHD. It's always been there. It's part of the genetics of ADHD. And so people in families that have ADHD family members also have people with emotion regulation problems as well. Longitudinal studies like my own have clearly shown that the emotional problems are highly persistent into adulthood, assuming that the disorder itself is persisting. And studies of adults with ADHD coming to clinics show that to be the case as well. And in both those areas of research, the symptoms of poor emotion regulation are as common as the traditional inattention and verbal impulsive symptoms are of ADHD. So uh, again, it's not like these are lesser symptoms, they're equivalent symptoms in terms of their frequency and importance. Look here, here's a study of children I followed for 25 years into adulthood, and you can't read the legend here, unfortunately, um, but the red is the children whose ADHD persisted into their late 20s. The blue are the children whose ADHD could no longer be formally diagnosed. Some of them had outgrown the disorder, not many, about 14%. Others had a reduction in symptoms so that they no longer met the DSM or our research criteria, but they were still highly symptomatic and impaired. So we call those non-persistent. And then here's our control group. And what you don't see over here is I had the prevalence, the percentage of people with ADHD showing these problems. Uh, and the percentages were up around 70 to 85%. So notice that if your ADHD persisted, your emotional control symptoms also persisted. And that's what these bars represent. Impatience, frustration, hostility, easily aroused, excitable, and so on. And here's a graph showing the same kinds of symptoms with adults with ADHD, precisely the same findings. Adults with ADHD have very prevalent emotion regulation problems, and the symptoms are as prevalent as inattention and impulsivity. So again, uh, there's nothing different, nothing new. We're just adding more to our understanding of what ADHD really is. It's not just an attention disorder. Now, putting impulsive emotion and problems with the self-regulation of emotion back into ADHD 
helps us understand comorbidity. Uh, this is a bit complex, but I'm going to go through this very quickly. We're going to use oppositional disorder just as an example, because it is the most common disorder. It's a pattern of hostility, anger, defiance, also low frustration tolerance. It's 11 times more common in ADHD, often arising within two years after the onset of ADHD. ODD is known to consist of two symptom dimensions. One, emotion dysregulation, that's the anger. The other, social conflict, that's the arguing, that's the refusal. And it turns out that both of those dimensions contribute to the risk for later disorders. The emotional dimension contributes to the risk for anxiety and depression by adolescents and going forward into adulthood. Indeed, the longer ADHD goes untreated and these emotions remain dysregulated, the greater the odds that these disorders will develop, particularly anxiety disorders, which is why only about 15 to 20% of children may have an anxiety disorder if they have ADHD, but the figure rises to 45 to 50% of adults with ADHD coming into clinics. Now, the social component of ODD predicts later conduct disorder and antisocial behavior. And that's because the social component of ODD is learned while the emotional component of ODD arises biologically from ADHD. ADHD creates one of the two dimensions involved in ODD. So if you're diagnosed with ADHD, you are one big step down the road to having ODD. All you have to do is get a little training within your family with regard to learning how to coerce people using negative emotions, and you will pick up the social conflict symptoms. This helps us to understand very clearly why emotion uh, and ODD are managed so well by ADHD medications but only if ADHD is there. If ODD is by itself, that's not true. Now, I did mention that parenting is also part of contributing to ODD the way parents handle child misbehavior. But the starting point, which is important to this lecture, is the emotion dysregulation caused by ADHD. And you can see that here, where we have ODD is first caused by a child's problems with emotion regulation arising from either ADHD or possibly a mood disorder. And then adding to that is the parenting component. And that also is going to contribute to the social component. Put those two together, you get a defiant child. Now, there are other components to this theory of ODD. Time doesn't permit me to go through all of these components. I wish I could get this to advance. There we go. Okay, it doesn't seem to want to activate very well, probably because I'm going way too quickly here. I can see that my time is passing. So let's get through that and just understand it doesn't seem to want to move. <laughs> Lily, I don't know if you can get this thing to move on. There we go. Okay. Uh, the other point I want to make is that putting emotion back in ADHD predicts a variety of impairments that are not predicted by inattention or by hyperactive impulsive behavior. Look at this long list of things that the emotion dysregulation uniquely predicts in the lives of people with ADHD, from social rejection to road rage, to intimate partner difficulties and even violence, uh, to problems with later alcohol abuse, risk for PTSD, occupational functioning, dating, uh, use of credit and impulsive buying. I mean, look at all of that. That's what emotions, when they're not properly regulated, are doing to the lives of people with ADHD. And that's just a short sample. There are clearly additional problems that are linked to the emotion regulation one as well. But I think the point's been made. So how does putting emotion back in ADHD help us diagnostically? First of all, it helps us to understand that when we see emotion regulation problems in people with ADHD, particularly very impulsive expression of emotion and difficulties grappling with and moderating emotion once it's provoked, that's ADHD. There's no reason to go looking for a comorbid disorder 
to explain that. That's the executive deficit, the emotion regulation problem. Well, how would you distinguish that from a mood disorder? One, it's very short duration. Emotions are not moods. They're short duration. They're setting specific. They're provoked. They're reasonable. We can understand what upsets you. We saw what happened. We would have been upset too, but we wouldn't have shown it to the degree that you did. So these are the things that go with ADHD emotion dysregulation. On the other hand, we do know that upwards of 20% or more of people with ADHD can have a mood disorder. So how would you distinguish a legitimate mood disorder from that emotion dysregulation? Well, look down here. Moods are long duration, lasting hours, days, weeks. Moods are cross-situational. Emotions are not. Moods are excessive, extreme, capricious, labile. And in the case of mood disorders, they're irrational. We don't understand what's upsetting the bipolar patient when they're manic or depressed. And often, the emotions are not provoked. And that is because they're sort of bubbling up from a poorly regulated limbic system or emotional brain. So I hope you can see that by putting emotion back in, we don't need to create comorbidity that really isn't there. How many times have we seen people with ADHD misdiagnosed as bipolar, borderline, and so on, when all the emotion that they were complaining about was part of their ADHD itself? Now, putting emotion back in ADHD helps us to understand treatment, because if you treat ADHD, we should see a downregulation in the emotional component of ADHD. And that's exactly what we see with the ADHD medications, which, by the way, as I've said, are just as good at treating ODD, anger, hostility, and aggression as they are at managing ADHD when ADHD is part of that comorbidity. Also, we understand that the different ADHD medications act differently to regulate emotion. Stimulants appear to quell and even dampen down the limbic system, leading sometimes to complaints that people on high doses of stimulants seem like an automaton, very robot-like, uh, have very bland emotion. On the other hand, the non-stimulants, like atomoxetine, are acting in a different part of the brain. They're helping to upregulate the executive brain, giving people more self-control of emotion. So they don't blunt emotion the way the stimulants do. Uh, and then, of course, the antihypertensive drugs, uh, such as clonidine or guanfacine, work by smoothing out the signals in the executive brain, the frontal cortex, by regulating the alpha-2 ports on those nerve cells. So each drug does it a little differently, which suggests that sometimes a few people may need drug combinations in order to get a more complete control over their ADHD and its emotional problems. Now, we also need to understand that you can't just treat the ADHD symptoms because the longer ADHD and the emotion problems have existed, the more likely there are going to be secondary impairments with social rejection. And as we said, with marital relations, occupational functioning, and so on. Uh, and those may require separate intervention if the ADHD medications don't resolve the difficulties completely, which they may not if they've gone on for a while. We're also learning that direct training of emotion regulation isn't very good for children and teens. Not an awful lot has been done in that area, but the few studies that tried it failed. On the other hand, by the time we get to adulthood, there is compelling evidence that cognitive behavior therapy that targets executive functioning, such as the programs by Mary Salanto, J. Russell Ramsey over at uh, University of Pennsylvania, Steve Safran when he was at Harvard, these programs do help to target stress management and emotion regulation. And provided that the adults are on medication, 
the CBT program boosts the effect of the medication in helping to improve symptoms and impairment. Now we're beginning to see some evidence that mindfulness-based meditation practices, such as are talked about in the new book by Lydia Zylowska and John Mitchell, uh, that is named just that, mindfulness-based intervention for adult ADHD. And they are showing, as are other scientists, that this seems to be a rather promising avenue for helping adults with ADHD, particularly with emotion and stress. Now, we need more research. That's not definitive, but very promising results so far with the number of studies that have been done. In the case of children, the emotion dysregulation uh, is better handled through the medications and then, to some extent, through behavioral parent training programs. Because remember, some of the anger, hostility, and defiance is coming about through parenting. Changing the parenting can help with that aspect of that emotion regulation problem of ODD. In addition, we know that parental ADHD can make things worse for child ADHD when you have two emotionally dysregulated people trying to live with each other and get along with each other, and neither is in treatment. That's why we argue that when a child is seen in a clinic for ADHD, the parents should be screened for the disorder because there's a, a very good probability that they have it, and that the parents' ADHD should be treated first or coincidental with the management of the child's ADHD. For this very reason, it's going to contribute its own problems to the family environment and the emotion dysregulation of the child. Lastly, just a couple of suggestions for how one might further go about helping people with ADHD with emotion problems. We're gonna use Gross's model of emotion. It's the most popular in psychology. And it goes like this. There's a situation, right, that arises. We select ourselves in and out of situations through our behavior. Something happens in that situation uh, that is emotionally provocative and we attend to that provocation. We quickly appraise it as threat or not and then we react with an emotion. So this all happens very quickly, within, if you will, hundreds of seconds. But by breaking it apart this way, we can see how we might help with managing emotion. First of all, we could start by situation selection, which simply means take an inventory of the situations that commonly provoke strong emotion, and then see whether or not so you have the potential to avoid them or opt out of them. In other words, one way of dealing with strong emotion is simply not to put yourself in places where it's likely to take place. Now, that's not always possible, but in the case of children and in some cases with adults, it's worth considering whether that would work. Uh, and by the way, the earlier in the sequence you intervene, the more successful it is at handling the emotional difficulty. So that would be a very powerful tool because it literally prevents the emotion from even being elicited. But suppose you find yourself in a situation and you can't leave and something emotional is happening. What could you do? Modify the situation. Change where you're sitting. Change what you're looking at. Distract yourself. And in other ways, try to modify it so that it helps you regain control of yourself and the emotion. Now, if that's not possible, try to redeploy your attention by covering your eyes, looking away, and even uh, thinking about other things that may be more conducive to positive emotions. But redirect your attention away from the stimulus and the event. Finally, what CBT does is it teaches the individual to cognitively reevaluate the situation and in so doing, help to see that it wasn't as uh, important emotionally as the person probably thought it was. Lastly, of course, it's easy to try to suppress the emotion that is easy to say, not so easy to do. Uh, but this is what medication does by
suppressing and moderating the underlying neural network for emotion. It is able to control the emotional response. So there's five different places a therapist could intervene to work with someone with ADHD. So to conclude, and then we'll take questions. I hope you've seen that problems in the pulse of emotion and emotional dysregulation have been a core part of the history of ADHD for 250 years. Impulsive emotion is linked, excuse me, to the impulsivity dimension of ADHD and the struggle with the executive control of emotions once they're provoked is part of the larger inattentive executive dimension of ADHD. We've seen that the neuroanatomy of ADHD supports this idea. The neuropsychology of ADHD does as well. The abundant psychological evidence shows that emotion is truly part of this disorder. And by understanding that, we can understand why ADHD poses such a big risk for oppositional disorder, anxiety disorder, depression, even conduct disorder downstream once ADHD gets going. We can also better understand the impairments that our patients have because it's stemming from the emotion, not from the inattention. And we can also improve our diagnosis and our management of people with ADHD by understanding that emotion dysregulation is part of what they are so concerned about. Thank you so much. Let's take some questions. Thanks very much. That was excellent. Um, Thank you. Are there differences in males versus females with regard to emotional regulation? Uh, there appears to be a little bit of evidence suggesting, yes, uh, that females may have more difficulty with certain emotions, particularly the regulation of anxiety and depression, much less so hostility and aggression, though both genders or sexes rather do struggle with impatience and frustration. Uh, so there does appear to be emerging. I don't want to make it sound definitive, but we do know that even in the general population, males are more prone to aggression, hostility generally, and females are more prone to anxiety, depression. And we see that exacerbated by this dysregulation emotion component in ADHD. Now that said, uh, there's new literature just coming out uh, in the August issue of my newsletter just out. Uh, there is a nice review of how female hormones can alter these emotional symptoms as these hormones um, are changing over the life course. Both the onset of menses and adolescence sees a second wave of problems with ADHD, especially emotion. Uh, during the annual or the monthly menses, rather, there is evidence for much stronger premenstrual symptoms of emotion. Uh, and then at menopause, there is additional evidence for females, again, experiencing more difficulties with their ADHD and their emotion. So uh, all of that is to say that these gender differences may have something to do with female hormones, progesterone and estrogen. At least that's the current suspicion given what limited evidence we have. Mm -hmm. uh, one attendee asked, does uh, emotional dysregulation change over time? Does it ever improve? Um, yes, it, it does. It does change uh, and it can improve. It just depends uh, on the individual uh, and what factors might be, in, be involved. For instance, uh, it's very uncommon to see problems with emotional self-regulation being complained about in parents of three and four-year-olds. They're concerned more with the impulsive aspect of emotion. Uh, we don't expect four-year-olds to manage their emotions very well. But on the other hand, by the time we get into late adolescence and especially adulthood, we do expect you to have that second stage of emotional control, which is this top-down executive management. And the fact that you don't have it is going to be more compelling, more impairing, and lead to more uh, judgments about you in adulthood than it would have 
in a much younger individual. So it's almost like the two components of this emotion problem are trading places. The impulsivity being more problematic in children, whereas the emotion regulation piece, when it develops in typical people, isn't developing well in the ADHD individual. And now that becomes a more compelling deficit for that individual. So yes, they can change. But we do know that some people with ADHD, roughly about 10 to 15 percent, may recover from their disorder. Uh, another 30 percent may improve, but still remain very symptomatic and impaired. Uh, and then finally, we have about two-thirds or more of people with ADHD in childhood being fully ADHD in young adulthood. And as the recent paper published last week showed, uh, the longitudinal study that was published, uh, ADHD is far, far more persistent than people had originally thought it to be. So yes, it can be. Now, as I've said, what part of the question was, can you train this? And I thought I had pointed out that uh, the likelihood of training it in a child is very slim uh, because children don't yet have full developed self-regulation and training requires a certain amount of self-regulation to benefit the individual. Uh, whereas with the children, I think it's better, as we said, to rely on the medications, work with the parents through parent training, look at that gross model of emotion for where we could be changing things in the environment to change situations that are provoking emotions and try to get at the problem that way. And then as we get into adulthood, maybe working more directly with the adults using cognitive behavior therapy and mindfulness-based programs to help them with dealing with this emotional symptom. Mm -hmm. Several parents have asked, when can they expect or when would they might they see symptoms of DESR in their child? Usually between, usually between three and five. And some parents, especially if the child is quite significantly hyperactive and impulsive, will see it even younger than that, but will often write it off as the terrible twos, believing that it's simply part of developmental normative behavior, right. only to find out that a year or so later, when other children have begun to move past that rather transient stage of learning how to use emotions to manipulate their parents, the ADHD child now has not gone on to that additional maturity and remains a very hot-headed emotional child. And if that's the case, those are the children that will move on very quickly to oppositional defiant disorder. Does DBT as a therapy help in this situation with emotional well, there's dysregulation? A, given that CBT does, there's yes. a good possibility <laughs> that it might, but no one, I've seen no research published using a, a specifically DBT format. All of the work has been done with more of a CBT targeting specifically executive functioning. And for a good example of that, as I suggested, have a look at Mary Salanto's book on that topic or that by Russ Ramsey. And you'll see uh, the, the kind of components to a CBT program that they have put together and tested in their research. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of parents have actually asked, <clears throat> as they often do about medication and giving it to their child, can you deal with DESR without medication? It's going child? to be very, very, very difficult uh, because as I said, how else are you going to deal with it? It isn't going to be through direct training. You've got a dysregulated brain with a highly variable, immature executive circuitry, part of which includes this problem with emotional expression and regulation. Uh, and to expect to try to find some other social or psychological intervention that corrects that, uh, I think is asking too much mm -hmm. of psychotherapy, uh, you know, social skills training, for instance, is an utter failure for this dimension of ADHD in children, which is why we don't recommend it. So I, I think, as I've said, with parents, we're, we're better off dealing with it through the medications combined with some behavioral parent training and with work with a therapist on what are the triggers 
for the emotion regulation while we await greater maturity of these neurological systems uh, with age. Mm -hmm. Is there residual emotional difficulty even after taking the medication? You're... Well, Go yes. Ahead. I mean, sometimes yeah. the medications can create their, their own problems. I mentioned one already. The, the stimulants are notorious in some people for creating emotional blunting, which is the absence of natural emotion in children or adults. A second problem I didn't mention is that as the stimulants wear off, it's not uncommon for the emotional brain to go through a rebound. And therefore, you might, in some people, see irritability, a proneness to weepiness or crying, sometimes even uh, a bit of uh, mild depression. Uh, so it's not common for everybody. Uh, but remember, you've been suppressing an emotional brain. And as the medication wears off, that could come to the fore. We don't see that with the non-stimulants so much because they're not suppressing the brain. Uh, they, if they have problems, tend to be more with sedation uh, rather than with um, emotional suppression. So again, each drug works on the brain a little differently and therefore works on emotion a little differently, which is why sometimes for very unusual and severe cases, you may see clinicians opting to combine these medications with each other to get a much broader coverage of patient symptoms than any single drug could do by itself. But that's uncommon. Mm -hmm. One parent is asking how, I mean, it's a fairly um, opaque concept yeah. to explain to a teacher. They want to know their child is having all kinds of problems, behavioral problems in fourth grade, and they want to know how to explain it to a teacher. Um, well. <laughs> you, you can try to explain it as a parent, but remember, the teacher is going to write you off as you're just a parent. Right. Uh, so it helps to come in armed with information. There's a nice fact sheet on my website under the fact sheets directory on the executive deficits associated with ADHD, including emotion. Uh, and Chad also has some very nice handouts that explain ADHD to educators, uh, and you could try that. You can ask them to look at YouTube. Uh, I have a number of lectures that people have posted there. Probably the most famous is the 30 essential things that parents need to know about ADHD. Uh, and teachers could just as easily benefit from that because in that lecture, we talk about this problem as well. So use resources, whether it's an ADHD parent book, whether it's my book for teachers managing ADHD in school, uh, whether it's a YouTube video or a fact sheet, go in armed with information that you can leave with the teacher so that you can show that it's not just you making this up, but that the experts have already concluded that these are major problems and that this child needs help. Mm -hmm. uh, several parents have asked, they wondered how their own ADHD could make their child's ADHD and thus emotional dysregulation worse. Can yeah, you get it? Well, I, yeah, easily could give you some examples. I mean, you, you have an impulsive parent who's displaying, for instance, let's say you have a child who engages in some defiant uh, oppositional behavior. Mm -hmm. The parent with ADHD is going to have a much stronger reaction to that and a more impulsive reaction to that, maybe one of anger, of hostility toward that child much more quickly than it would take a typical parent to reach that level of uh, emotional uh, upset. Uh, now, when a parent starts to do that, A, they're modeling emotional behavior to a, a child. B, they're provoking a child who has their own emotion regulation problems. Uh, and so you're triggering the child more, even worse than they naturally would be just if we only understood their ADHD. Uh, and now what you have is what I think of as a veritable emotional tornado going on in the mm -hmm. family where each person is triggering the other one to higher and higher levels of conflict. Uh, and that's what we do see in these families that have where this has lasted a long time. Mm -hmm.
several parents have asked how, uh, what parenting course might be able to best manage ODD in their child? Well, there are at least eight or nine well-researched behavioral parent training programs mm -hmm. out there. Uh, obviously, I have one called Defiant Children, but there's Sheila Iberg's program, which is the parent-child interaction therapy, uh, very similar. Uh, there is also the Triple P program by uh, Dads and Sanders, which is, you know, the positive uh, parenting program. We have the program uh, out in Seattle by Carolyn Webster Stratton, which is the Incredible Years program for very young preschool children. So there's a variety of these programs. But, you know, the research shows they all overlap to a great extent and they all achieve the same degree of improvement. So no one program is necessarily any better than the others. And part of that is because they all originated out in Oregon. And that's where I trained. Uh, and that was the first place that behavioral parent training was occurring. And all the other programs are spinoffs on the original Connie Hanf program. Uh, that is most of them anyway, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the people who I've just mentioned trained or worked out there at that institution. And by the way, I'm happy to see that OHSU was a sponsor uh, and also happy to acknowledge that I trained there as well in 1976 wow. to 77 uh, <laughs> as part of their uh, children's program, their medical psychology program. So um, yes, I mean, uh, we can see lots of programs. Find the one that matches you, that is more suitable to your disposition, your temperament, your way of training. But there is a, a ton of them out there. Mm -hmm. Does trauma or PTSD exacerbate DESR? Um, it's bidirectional. What little longitudinal research we have suggests that ADHD, because of the emotion dysregulation especially, sets children up to be at higher risk for traumatic events. Uh, if you will, they're sort of the victim and the architect of trauma. <laughs> they're, right. they're harder to manage. Uh, and if they're with a parent or a loved one or a, a stranger, for instance, who has their own psychological problems, they're more likely to be traumatized because they're so difficult to manage. And then once a trauma has occurred, the child with ADHD is more likely to progress to a PTSD reaction, whereas only one in five typical children experiencing a significant trauma ever develops PTSD, uh, which is why ADHD is one of the strong predictors of who within a population, if they are exposed to trauma, will develop PTSD. And that includes, by the way, soldiers going into warfare. ADHD soldiers are much more likely to come back with PTSD than are others uh, who don't have that disorder. So it's kind of an interaction. And as a result, once the PTSD develops, it then is making the emotion regulation problems even worse than they needed to be. But I, I want to make it clear that the emotional trauma or even physical trauma is not necessarily causing the ADHD downstream. Usually the ADHD is the pre-existing condition to the trauma, but both can occur uh, and interact uh, in a very complex way to lead us to have an individual with very serious emotion regulation problems stemming from both of those sources. Mm. And lastly, I don't want to let this go. There's a 73 year old who's listening in who was just diagnosed and has had emotional dysregulation most of his life. He right. wants to know, is it too late? Is there, is he up against the wall on this one or? Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. In fact, there was a wonderful, uh, article by Sandra Cooey, who's an expert in Holland on ADHD in adults and particularly in the elderly, where she talks about the diagnosis and management of ADHD in late life. Uh, and it, the bottom line is it's never too late to benefit from these interventions that we've talked about. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kudos to the gentleman for getting diagnosed uh, this late. Uh, but please don't hesitate to, to seek treatment for it. It can be, as Sandra argues, extremely beneficial, uh, even at that stage of life. Mm -hmm. So, 
So Wayne, I thank you very much for yes. having me on the thank program. You. And I want to thank Lily for her assistance with my misbehaving slideshow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank all of you for tuning in and hope that you found this uh, an informative program. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Y'all. Yes, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. It was so good and enlightening. So, and thanks to all of the attendees for joining us. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day.